using best practice to manage chronic edema in primary care. Now, I have plenty of learning objectives for you today. Some of you will remember earlier on in the year we looked at uh, lymphedema and chronic edema. And what I want us to do today is try to understand and highlight how underestimated the prevalence of chronic edema is within your nursing or general practice workload. We'll also do a little bit of recap as to why and how chronic edema develops. And by using a new document that we've been working on for the last six months, we'll ensure best practice for this patient group so that we can see how patients with chronic edema are assessed and treated appropriately. One of the cornerstones of treatment of edema is compression and hopefully I'm going to go through with you how to apply compression, how to measure for compression garments and to look at why at the moment we're stopping below the knee. We need to start to think of assessing the whole limb. Below the knee is not always enough. So bringing you on to the new chronic edema best practice statement. This is an evidence-based research support that enables you, the primary care clinician, to effectively identify those hidden patients, assess them and manage those patients with chronic edema. We know that the extent of the problem within the UK health services is increasing. Remember last time we spoke, I told you about chronic edema. I explained that it is a progressive and debilitating condition that requires long-term management and long-term self-management by the patient. The prevalence of chronic edema at the moment in the UK is greater than that of long-term conditions such as stroke, cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. And we know that the number of people with chronic edema is set to increase as the population demographics change with increasing ageing and polymorbidity. So what is the prevalence of chronic edema within the UK at present? Well, current statistics suggest that almost one in, uh, sorry, four in 1,000 patients present with chronic edema. In the over 85 age bracket, that's 12 in 1,000. And of those, 50 to nearly 70% of the patients that you see will be nursed in their own homes or in the community. And 73% have leg ulceration as well as chronic edema. What does that mean for our future? Well, experts are predicting that by 2039, there will be 3.5 million people aged over 85 years. Now you put that into perspective with the 12 in 1000 people with chronic edema. So just to recap for you guys, the broad chronic edema is a broad term that we use to describe edema that is present in a limb or part of the body for three months or more. In terms of this presentation, I'll probably be concentrating more on lower limb chronic edema rather than the upper limb, breast, trunk, head, neck or genital edema. But we know that with chronic edema, it doesn't respond very well to elevation and it certainly does not respond to diuretics. So the 20 to 80 milligrams of furosemide often prescribed to these patients actually is doing more harm than good. Quick recap onto the anatomy and physiology. As you know, the lymphatic system is very, very closely related to our cardiovascular system. Within the cardiovascular system, we move blood from the arterial to the venous side to bathe the cells in nutrient and oxygen-rich fluid. That oxygen-rich fluid exchanges within the cells and then picks up waste products, proteinaceous products, bacterial bits, viral bits, and carbon dioxide, which is then reabsorbed back into the vascular system, or the extra fluid then goes into the blind-ended tubules of the lymphatic system. In the lymphatic system, that fluid is moved through a series of lymph nodes where the fluid is cleaned, and the bacteria and viral particles 
are processed so that we have an immune response and we are protected against those particular um, invading uh, elements. We know that the majority of the tissue fluid that is formed at the capillary bed is reabsorbed by the lymphatics. So that when chronic edema or lymphedema develop, we know that this is purely down to a failure of the lymphatics to cope with whatever the cause of the edema is in the first place. That being dependency, so the act of gravity on the limb or on the part of the body that is hanging low and dependent. Heart failure, venous insufficiency and venous hypertension. Cancer, treatment and reoccurrence. Renal failure, trauma, surgery, and in particular, infections such as cellulitis. But the biggest cause we're starting to see in the 21st century is edema that is secondary to obesity and to lifestyle choices becoming more sedentary and more and more overweight. So, we know that within our nursing and our general practice workload, Patients are hiding from us with lower limb lymphedema and chronic edema. So we've got to identify these patients. We've got to find them, look for them. Have a look at the feet of your patients when you go in to see them. Have a look at their legs. Identify them and then look for the assessment process. And in the new document that we've been working very hard on over the last six months, We've used an approach of assessment using the six S's. Story, self-care, sight, skin, size and shape. So the story, this is integral and essential to understanding your patient's background. Getting their history to identify the possible causes of edema by thorough history taking, you can identify the known risk factors for developing chronic edema, i.e. the patient is sedentary, sleeping in a chair, has cardiovascular issues. You can then go on to look at underlying medical conditions, certain types of medication that will predispose to edema, and other issues to do with lifestyle choices. Where possible, contributing issues can be addressed and management of that patient and their edema is optimised to ensure that any plan of care is successful. So, second part, self-care. This is something I can't stress enough to you. Getting your patient on side, getting them involved in managing a lifelong uh, condition such as chronic edema is absolutely crucial. Self-management means that the patient has the capacity to live well over time and this is a key ingredient to the NHS long-term plan that improves efficiency within our NHS, frees up valuable resources and enables patients to be self-caring. Do remember that self-management does not mean that you abandon your patient. It does mean that you enter into a dynamic and empowering method of nursing and care with that patient. So you've got to engage them. You've got to be literate in the problem itself so that you can enable your patient to be health literate to enable and encourage that patient to be willing and to place your patient central to all the decision makings and all the care delivery that they're going to require. Within self-care, we can do lots of things such as support with application. Trust me, the rubber washing up gloves are the cheapest and most effective option for putting on a garment. I use one myself. But there are other devices that enable patients who have limited mobility or poor grip for them to be able to be involved in putting on and taking off their own compression garments. So the third part, where is the edema? Tell me about the site of edema. The location of chronic edema gives us clues to possible underlying causes and informs us where the compression should be applied. Underlying causes such as urological or gynaecological cancer in which lymph nodes have been removed, leaving swelling in the lower legs or in one leg, unilateral swelling for example. But when you're assessing that patient, 
make sure you look above where you believe the edema to be and further down from where the edema to, should be. So if you're looking at a limb, also examine the buttocks, the sacrum, the genitals and the abdomen. Remember how important it is to look at somebody with an apron, for example, someone who's got excess resource in the abdomen. They may well actually have quite severe edema of that apron and that will need treating also. Look at the site, compare and contrast the left and the right side. Has the swelling been there for at least three months? Okay, is it localised to one particular limb or one particular area of the limb? All right, look closely, feel that site, feel the tissues. The skin. This is one of our most underappreciated organs of the body and only when it goes wrong do we realise what it does for us, second only really to the lymphatic system. Chronic edema has a huge detrimental effect on the skin. Remember, the fluid is rich in bacterial breakdown, toxins, carbon dioxide, but also rich in protein. And protein dries the skin from the inside out. Because the failure of the lymphatics to clear fluid from the tissues allows the accumulation of this protein-rich fluid to start to absorb water from the inside out. So patients with chronic edema are vulnerable to skin damage, skin breakdown, and because the lymphatic system isn't working, and the lymphatic system is part and parcel of your immune system, it doesn't take long for an infection, ulcer, and, and damage to the skin to occur. So observe the skin. You're looking for the following. You're looking for changes in pigmentation that might indicate venous disease, so haemosiderin pigmentation. You're observing for redness. Is the redness bilateral or unilateral? Is it cellulitis or is it red leg syndrome? Look between the webbing of the fingers and toes for fungal infections. Hyperkeratosis, overgrowth of the skin with thickening and skin plaques that harbour fungal and bacterial infections. Wounds can actually hide under hyperkeratosis. And then we're looking for the, the, the leakage of lymph or lymphorrhea. Now, if I was to say the word hemorrhage to you, you'd immediately want to call 999 and help that patient. But we don't do that with lymphorrhea or lymphorrhage. Last year at BLS, Rebecca Elwell talked about lymphorrhea as a hemorrhage of lymph. That patient with lymphorrhea that is significant is losing protein, they're losing salts, they're losing body fluids, and they are more open to infection. Perhaps if we change lymphorrhea to lymphorrhage, and we gave it the same impact as hemorrhage, we might start to take it a little bit more seriously than we currently do. And again, I will point you, point you in the direction of a very good web resource, the, red, uh, the Wet Leg Pathway, written by a colleague of mine, Karen Morgan and Melanie Thomas. It's a PDF document, it's there for you to use, and it will enable you to assess and begin the treatment of wet legs in the community without the input or while waiting for the input of a specialist. Looking at size, so look at the size of the limb. So you think, well, in lymphedema clinics or chronic edema clinics, they use specialist techniques to measure. No, not really. The points that I'm going to show you later when we look at how to measure a limb, okay, those points can be used as points of measurement that you can document over time that patient's journey as you decongest and reshape their limb. So simple measurements taken at set points will enable you to show the patient just how far they've moved and just what's happening to them in terms of managing their chronic edema. I mean, on the photos that you can probably see before you now, you can see how with um, a decongestive therapy, the size of the limbs have been changed, the shape of the limb has been improved, and we can actually see that we've healed one of the ulcers there. Shape, point six. What shape is your patient's limb? 
Is it champagne bottle, like an inverted wine bottle? Are there big skin folds? Or are there skin folds and creases over the flexures? Does the swelling extend beyond the limb? Are the toes infected? There's so much we can do by looking at the shape because by adapting our bandaging or our dressing or our wrapping techniques, we can actually improve the shape and decongest those areas without causing pressure sores or problems to the skin. For example, edema of the toes, traditionally we used to bandage. How many of you district nurses, community nurses have time to toe bandage? Not many. Toe caps, gloves for edema of the hands. So if the swelling extends to the feet and the toes and you need compression, simply apply a toe cap. It's that quick. Let's think about where we compress to. Traditionally, we tend to compress to the knee. That isn't always the right answer. Look at the photos in front of you now. You can see beautifully shaped, decongested feet and ankles, but look at the edema above where the compression has stopped. Sometimes we have to think we need to compress further. We need to do more for this patient. So let's go back to the four cornerstones of care. If you remember, skin care, compression, movement and exercise, intensive treatment in the phase one part of the compression uh, and, and treatment of care reduces limb volume, reshapes the lower limb and gives the patient a better mobility so that they can move and exercise more. Can you imagine some limbs can have up to four litres of fluid in them that you very gently move with wrapping systems or with multi-layer bandaging. As soon as you're not carrying that weight around, it's much more easy to mobilise. So after we've decongested and after we've reshaped the limb, we need to maintain that. So we need to think about compression garments. So using our best practice document, which will be available to you, I'd like to talk to you about Mr. Um, Oliver Jones. He was a patient of mine who came to my attention about 18 months ago, and he presented with unilateral venous leg ulceration, but bilateral lower leg and foot edema. He told me that the swelling had been present for 15 to 18 years, but the ulcer on the right leg had been reoccurring and remitting for at least five years. He said it had never fully healed in that time. And he was being seen thrice weekly for dressings by the practice nurse or by my really brilliant healthcare assistant, Emma. He said that he'd had a trial of compression bandaging and he was not going to do it again. Carrying on looking at him, he didn't have any drug allergies, but he did have type 2 diabetes linked to his morbid obesity, BMI of 38. He had hypertension, again that goes hand in hand. And as you can see there, he was on amylodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, which we know exacerbates lower limb lymphedema and chronic edema. So at this point, I had a quick chat with him about swapping and changing. Now, I'm an independent prescriber, so I was really happy to talk to him about adjusting and managing his hypertension in a different way. If you're not and you're worried but you notice amylodipine or philodipine or any of the calcium channel blockers on a patient's prescription, have a quick word with the GP. Ask them what they think, whether they think they can change it. He also had mild COPD and a generalised arthritic um, or osteoarthritis of multiple joints. And that affected his sleeping. Sometimes he slept in a chair when his back was too painful. Sometimes he slept in a chair because his prostate played him up and he was up and down to the toilet four, five, six times a night and it was just easier to stay in the chair. But we know dependency with the legs down even on those lovely reclining chairs, leads to a worsening of the edema. He was a very independent gentleman, or he is a very independent gentleman, um, and he's very fit and well in all activities of living, with the exception of his wound care. 
he refused carers or help. So we're here, we're talking to him, we're looking at the size of his legs, the shape of his legs. We can see the wounds on the lateral malleolus of the right leg and just on the back of the leg. We can see that he's had these wounds for some time, they're quite big, they were quite sluffy and they had lots of exudate pouring out of them. So we had the sight, the shape, the skin care, the self care. He didn't want compression. He would not have compression. So carrying on our assessment using our best practice document, we could feel his legs, they were firm and woody. He had no signs of arterial insufficiency. So there's no blanching on elevating his legs. His Doppler ABPI was within normal limits. Um, and he demonstrated good um, patterns in terms of sleeping. He didn't need to dangle his feet out of bed at a night three or four times because of poor arterial flow. So he was an excellent candidate for compression. Let's go back to self-care. He didn't want it. So what did we do? We needed a care plan that would enable all three of us nurses that were involved in Mr Oliver's care to do the same thing. Okay, not doing their own thing as was first happening, but to all work together. So we formulated a plan of care. So there was Emma, uh, Vanessa, Susanna and myself, and we sat down and we decided we need to wash his leg in tap water and apply emollients because his skin was dry. Any type of dressing that would enable absorption of the exudate and many times we intimated at compression. And Emma was absolutely spot on on this because she saw him the most three times a week. Every time she saw him, she'd say to him, do you want this wound to heal? Yes, Emma, I do. Well, if we need this wound to heal, Mr. Oliver, we've got to put you in compression. If this is a realistic goal for him to have a wound that heals, we needed regular review, Emma needed support, and I started to explain the wrap system to it. He refused bandaging. Finally, he agreed. He also agreed to be measured for a class one compression sock for his other leg. We're moving somewhere. This is over the course of about eight to 10 months. You can see the wound is slowly reducing in size. It's granulating from the base. It's epithelializing from the edges. Long-term management, self-care. Mr. Oliver was fully healed after 12 months of treatment using the Jobs Faro Wrap Strong. We even measured him and issued him with a prescription for self, for um, flat knit um, below knee garments that he occasionally wears to formal or family functions. But I'll be honest with you, he's happy in his wraps. He wants to wear his wraps. That is empowering him in self-care. So the self-care that he's imparting is that he wears his wraps to go out, to do his shopping. It only took five years to heal that wound. Now it's healed, he means to keep it that way. So why does compression therapy work so well? Why is it that when we start to put venous ulcers into compression, patients with venous ulcers into compression, their ulcers start to get smaller and start to heal? It enhances the pumping action of the muscles. It acts as a counterforce when the muscles are at rest, preventing filtration of fluid, okay? And the graduation actually directs the lymph flow up the limb towards the core of the body and returns it back to our circulation. So, the aim of compression in phase one is to decongest, reshape, and encourage the wounds to heal. So we encourage venous and lymphatic return. And we can do that by applying a wrap compression system, quick, easy, and for the most part, manageable by most patients. Or we can go in with multilayer lymphedema bandaging, which is a short stretch technique. We want to reduce that oedema. We want to improve that patient's quality of life. So successful decongestion, reshaping those limbs, healing the wound, improving skin quality. Phase two is we now need to maintain it.
that limb shape has to be kept, the decongestion has to be kept, the venous and lymphatic return encouraged and support that pumping action of the calf muscle. So this is when we start to think about what class do we need to put our patients into. Now you'll hear class one, class two, class three. If we look at the International Lymphedema Framework, the ILF, they say to us that the evidence is there to suggest that class one under a RAL compression and class two using the RAL formula as well is the best that we can put our patients into. Not British standard, not French, not US, which you will see when you're looking for garments, but to put patients into a RAL guaranteed class system will give you 18 to 21 millimetres of mercury at class one or 23 to 32 at class two and so forth all the way up to a class 4 super or a class 4 forte depending is that okay do you get what i'm saying here so don't look for a british standard you want to look for the best that there is out there and that is the ral compression classification what about choosing the type of compression well you can see me i'm in a flat knit garment i love the flat knit the flat knit is like a paper cup it will only hold a set volume and after that there is no more give in the, t in, in the system whereas a circular knit which is just like the tights that you buy and wear every day ladies sorry gentlemen but the circular knit is more like a balloon that you start to fill with water it will expand to a certain point to hold a volume of water but like a balloon and also like your knicker elastic any elastic garment will try and revert to its original shape and size. So if there is any abnormality in shape of the, of the limb that you're applying it to, if there are any skin folds, if there are any uh, creases over a flexure, you're going to get a tourniquet from a circular knit garment. And that garment will dig in and cause pressure sores. At the, at, at the least and will also cause problems with the circulation at the worst okay so flat knits are great for legs or arms that have got slight skin folds or changes in shape your circular knit you mustn't put it on that type of limb so how do we measure so you can see here we've got different measuring points and I'm going to ask Katie to come in and I will show you how to measure using set anatomical points. So if I just get down here on the floor. Thank you, Katie. First of all, we have a jobs to measuring board here and Katie's heel is back to the board. What I'm looking for is line A. And line A or point A where I'm going to measure is over the metatarsal interphalangeal joints here. A, and then we come to Y. Y is a loose V shape that measures from the calcaneum to the front of the foot. B is our narrowest point at the ankle. B1 is where the Achilles tendon moves into the gastrocnemius muscle or the calf muscle. C, here, is the widest part of the calf. We then come to D, which is two fingers below the patella, below the kneecap. E is at the crease, or the very centre of the kneecap. And then if I could just ask you to hold that up, thank you Katie. And we go up to F, and then looking for the gluteal fold here, that gives us our G. So we've got A, Y, B, B1, C, D, E, F, and G. Now, how do you measure? How do we get the tape where we want it? If I may, with the A, you just lay the tape over, and I get that at 23 centimetres. There's no tension in that tape. The Y measurement is a little more tricky as you have to get it under the calcaneum to cross at the front of the foot. And again, this is a measurement you can loosen off or you can tighten up, 
depending on the shape of the limb. I mean, luckily for us, Katie's got a beautifully shaped leg. But if this has got a big fold of skin, if this is a patient with a big fold of skin over the ankle, you'll have to loosen that Y measurement. And I make that at 31 centimetres. Again, now we come to the B, laying the tape gently over 22 centimetres. B1, again gently over 29. Now let's have a look at C. C, when I lay it gently it's 38, but let me give it a squeeze. I can get it to 36, so I'd probably go 36.5 there. I want a grip on the C because that is a traction point. That is a point where your garment's going to hold. D, nicely, gently laying the tape over, 37. E is your flexure, this is your knee zone, so you need to be able to move your knee if you're going for a thigh length. 38 centimetres, again, a gentle, gentle laying on of the tape. F, again, we're going to have a grip zone here. So I've got it at 52 by laying the tape over. Oh, but look, I can get it to 49 by giving it a squeeze. So I'd probably go to about 50. Okay, I hope that's making sense. And then your G, again, a very gentle laying over of the tape. 65 centimetres, don't squeeze, no need to squeeze there, you'll have a grip top on that. And then for the length, you've got your skin all marked up beautifully. You can use your footboard to get the foot length. Do you hold that? So we've now got A to B is approximately 11 centimetres, A to B1, 21, 31, 39, at E, 45, at F, 67, and then up to the gluteal fold, 73. Very, very simple way of actually measuring. Use your footboard. More of that later. Okay. Whew. So that's how to measure. You get very quick at measuring the more you do it. So, in summary, the new chronic edema best practice statement has been written by experts and by generalists to help you achieve the best clinical outcome for your patient. The new practice statement aims to ensure that you can identify that patient group and that you can assess them appropriately using the six S's. So come on, skin, self-care, sight, oh I've missed it, sh shape, stage, and come on story that's it get the story from the patient so use your successes so can patients be measured while lying down thank you keith yes they can you can appreciate that getting the foot length is far more accurate on a patient that is stood up but you can successfully measure patients as they are lying down. Remember, not all patients with a dependency edema are able to stand. So that's a really good question. Thank you. So Rebecca, hello, Rebecca. Are infections and lymphorrhea a cause or a consequence of edema? Oh, that's a really good question. Predominantly, lymphorrhea and infections are secondary to chronic edema. But the more infections you get, the more damaged your lymphatics become, the more likely you are to get lymphorrhea and an exacerbation of the chronic edema. So you're now into a really uh, vicious cycle of infection, lymphorrhea, worsening of the lymphedema. The aim of, of all long-term care is to try to prevent those infections and to keep the lymphatics as badly damaged as they are, but working as optimally as possible. So if you can prevent lymphorrhea and infections with good skin care, weight maintenance, keeping the patient moving and compression, then you can prevent the edema from worsening. But that's a really good question, Rebecca. Thank you. Question three, do you compress weeping legs? Absolutely you do, absolutely. I'm going to direct you again to Morgan et al, uh, 2017,
the wet leg pathway. Um, it's been uh, ratified by uh, Professor Mortimer, um, the Wound Care Society. This is a way of you in the community beginning care for patients with weeping legs. Compression is the only thing that will stop legs from weeping. And if you can start with the wet leg pathway, whilst you either research how to look to apply wraps yourself or you refer into an appropriate specialist uh, service, then we can start to prevent the infections and a worsening of the edema. So yes, absolutely vital to compress we weeping legs, providing of course the patient doesn't have arterial insufficiency. Anne, what do you do if you've got a patient who has heart failure and chronic bilateral edema? Well, the first thing I do, Anne, is I see how secure and how stable their heart failure is. If they are relatively stable and they're maintained on their medication and they're not short of breath, I start low and I start slow and I start with one leg at a time. That is how I would deal with chronic bilateral edema in somebody with heart failure. The last thing you want to do is put them quickly into bilateral compression that's going to move four litres of fluid from their feet straight to their lungs. No, I quite agree. So what we would do, what I would personally do, is I would work with that patient very, very slowly over time, ensure their heart failure is stable, and very start low and start slow with the compression. So that would be something like a very low class one um, lower limb garment to begin with on one leg at a time. Lisa. What advice would you give patients in heart failure and the risk of overloading? Absolutely, as, as with the, the previous question, Lisa. Um, if the patient has heart failure and they're at risk of overloading, you have to tell them any increase in breathlessness, take the garment off. If you're feeling difficulty with breathing, any dyspnea, shortness of breath at rest, get those garments off and seek prompt medical um, treatment through out of hours, 111 or through your own general practice. Emma, are the measurements the same when ordering wraps? Yes, they're very similar. Um, on the form for, um, for, for Faro wraps, okay, you would measure at very similar points using B and C measurements. So the narrowest part of the ankle the widest part of the, um, of the calf, and then you'd also measure the length of the leg as I showed you how to do, okay? So yes, the measurements are the same. In fact, it's, it's almost much simpler to measure for wraps than it is to measure for made-to-measure stockings. Amy, how do we get the toe caps for people with wet toes? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you can. Absolutely. But as soon as you start to compress the toes, that wetness should start to decrease over the next few days. Um, one of the other things that I tend to do is dress the toes very carefully with absorbers and put a toe cap on top of that. Um, but the toe caps are there. There's many manufacturers who make the toe caps, but you just have to make sure that you've ordered plenty to get them all into wash. Okay. So the final question is from Jenny. How soon do you recommend Doppler assessment for leg wounds before introducing compression? As soon as you identify a patient, Jenny, who you believe to have chronic edema, start the Doppler assessment. Ankle brachial pressure index or toe brachial pressure index. But don't forget, use your own eyes, use your own intuition and your own nursing common sense. If you've got a patient with shiny, shiny legs, no hair growth and blue toes, you can almost guess that your Doppler assessment is going to say to you that there's arterial insufficiency there. If you have a patient who needs to dangle their feet or gets intermittent claudication symptoms, you know that there's arterial issues going off. But I would do a Doppler assessment as soon as humanly possible from the minute you've identified that that patient has got chronic edema and wounds related to it. I hope that helps. Thank you ever so much for listening this evening. It's been my pleasure to meet you all.